All right, so maybe we'll get started. Um, if one of the QSEC organizers can find a way to get me an approximate total number of uh, attendees in this, I don't know if it's something I'm able to see, but I will need that in a few minutes if they can just type it into the chat. Uh, but for now, um, I'll go ahead and get started. So my name is John Howitt. I work at a company called Canaxis, and uh, my team and myself specialize in making software that helps our customers plan their supply chains. So what that means is, you know, you take something like a phone, it's got a bunch of parts in it, a screen, case, chips, antenna, for example, a customer gets an order for a thousand phones, each one of those needs to be sourced, uh, possibly from around the world, uh, brought together into the same facility, uh, run down assembly lines that perhaps compete with other things uh, for, for capacity, uh, assembled and then shipped it in the world in, in distribution networks to, to reach their final customer. So what our software will do is it'll say, you know, given the set of demands, you should source this many chips from there, this many screens from there, this site's under capacity, this site's over capacity, and, and here's when your customer's going to expect to get their goods. So that's, that's what our uh, software um, does and, and what I uh, in particular work on. So what I wanted to talk about today was supply chain management and you. Um, I went through a computer science background. Um, you know, I, I, went, I did my undergrad and, and grad school at Carleton. Um, and supply chain wasn't something I'd ever really heard about during that. I mean, obviously I was aware of what it was, but I really had no idea um, how complex the field was, how deep it was, uh, how interesting it was. And um, as we can see now uh, in the midst of this global pandemic, we can see how critical it is. So early on in the pandemic, we saw supply chain issues with toilet paper. And, and now at this point in the pandemic, um, we're seeing um, supply chain issues with vaccines. So I, I wanna to try to impart to you how important this area is and how we as software developers, you know, computer scientists, software engineers uh, can make a big difference um, in this field. So I'll start by talking about this sort of humble beginnings. Um, there's a famous essay uh, written by someone named uh, Leonard E. Reed, which, which we see here. And this is a book um, about the journey um, of a pencil. Um, it talks about the entire life cycle um, of that pencil. Um, so, you know, it starts uh, in terms of like the cedar trees where the wood of that pencil came from. It talks about the graphite mined for the lead of the pencil. Um, it talks about um, the rubber and its eraser, uh, the paint, uh, the lacquer and the finish. It talks about the machinery used to put it together, the humans employed to manufacture the pencil. Uh, it talks about the lighthouse keeper uh, who guides the shipments uh, into the port. Uh, it was essentially a pencil's version of what we call today um, a supply chain. Uh, the author, uh, Leonard Reed, passionately believed in the free market, uh, and he wanted to show in this essay that even the simplest conceivable good uh, was the result of a vast globe of uh, supply chains. And what's more than this good being just simple, right, a pencil is you know, an arguably pretty simple thing, there's a great deal of complexity in manufacturing it, uh, but even more, think about how ubiquitous um, the pencil was uh, at, at the time this was written, which, you know, by the way, was quite a while ago. It was in uh, 1958. So even something that is uh, as simple seeming to us and ubiquitous as a pencil has a huge amount of complexity behind it. And I would argue that by and large, you know, that idea still very much stands up today. Um, although we would perhaps want to modernize that instead of iPencil, we, we might call it iPhone, but, you know, we'd, we'd probably get sued right away. So I wanna talk a little bit about what that supply chain looks like. It's very tempting to fall into the trap of saying, oh, it looks like this, right? These phones get manufactured in this factory, they get loaded onto planes, they arrive at airports, they get loaded into trucks, they're driven to stores where they're purchased by the consumer. Um, that's certainly what I thought. Um, perhaps naively before entering the field of supply chain planning. But of course, this picture is very misleading. It's really not um, as simple as maybe we would like. It looks more like this, this massive web of intricate and uh, uh, complex uh, distribution and manufacturing. So in the real world, these components don't all live in the same spot, right? You don't just have a factory full 
of everything you need, you assemble it out and, and send it out. Uh, it, it's really not that simple. Instead, you probably have factories that produce these different components, right? So, you know, up here, we might see a factory that produces the screens. We might have chips produced to this other one. Maybe, you know, your phone has, has a camera in it. Maybe that gets produced to this other factory. And, you know, multiple factories might produce the same goods depending on how many varieties of phones you have and how expensive those things are and what the raw materials for those things in turn look like. Uh, and then probably, you know, once these are uh, assembled uh, and brought together, they're probably shipped off to other factories or warehouses where they're kept or assembled and stored until, you know, they're needed somewhere else. So maybe this middle thing here, this is like a national distribution center that you would have in, say, Canada. And down here, you have like a secondary or regional distribution center that you have in, say, Ontario. And then at that point, you know, these things can go um, to the final end user, which for our purposes is just the store. That's where the consumer would go to actually get their goods. And it's not too hard to see that this makes things a lot more complicated. So let, let's, let's take this one here, for example. This is one warehouse servicing another warehouse, and there's two paths that go there. Right, that might represent one path that is, uh, you know, transporting by plane, whereas another one by truck or or by train. And you get into these situations where there are natural trade-offs between cost and expediency, and that's that's a huge concern in supply chain, right? Like, how quickly can we satisfy these demands? So, what the software ultimately has to do is figure out a way of satisfying those demands in as efficient a way as possible. Uh, so that the users, uh, the end users, the customers are satisfied, but in a way that doesn't cost us uh, or the company that's doing that production um, a lot of money. And one way to think about money is not just in terms of actual cash, but also in terms of, of waste, right? So waste could mean, you know, you don't want to send things onto a plane unnecessarily because that's more costly, even though it might get it to your, your customers sooner. So this, this is why you know, supply chain is a little bit more complicated. And of course, even this is a drastic oversimplification because I didn't tell you how these uh, screens get made. I didn't tell you how these chips get made. I didn't tell you how these cameras get made. Each one of those is kind of like a nested version um, of, of this process. We answer a variety of questions for our customers um, as, at, at Canaxis. And these are just a, a small subsection of the types of things that we would need to answer. So, for example, what parts do I need uh, to build this finished good? Um, where should I order my materials from? Right. Like if you have to order in chips. So maybe, you know, you're a you're a cell phone manufacturer that doesn't manufacture its own uh, like chips. Um, you need to get them from a supplier. Which supplier do you get them from? Do you get them from the cheapest one? Do you get it from the most reliable one? Do you get it from the nearest one? Um, do you maybe hedge your bets and split it amongst several suppliers so that if one has a problem, at least you get a fraction of, of your demand satisfied? Uh, when do I need my next shipment of materials? Uh, when should I place that order? Should I place it a little bit earlier in case my supplier is late? Um, should I maintain some level of safety stock in case there's a huge spike in demand for, say, toilet paper? Um, who are my most reliable suppliers? Uh, looking back historically, can I glean any information about you know, who I should trust in the future? Uh, and finally, why are my customer orders late? So if you're consistently delivering your phones late, is that something that you can action in your network? Is it because your suppliers are late? Is it because your processing, uh, your manufacturing process is inefficient? Is it because you need to add another shift at your, at your factory? Um, the point of this type of endeavor, this line of research, this you know, set of software development uh, activities, uh, it's just as much about exposing these types of inefficiencies and identifying them so that humans can correct them as it is about manually writing or uh, sorry, autom uh, automatically writing around them. Both of those are important, but some decisions just require human uh, intervention. Really, what all these are getting at is how do I react when or if something goes wrong? Um, I've talked to a number of you um, in some of the sessions we've had today at the speed networking or, or at the career fair. And a lot of people have asked, you know, what kind of forecasting do you do? Um, forecasting is important and it's, it's something our software offers and, and, and it is critical to be able to attempt to do forecasting. But if you're given a choice 
between putting all of your effort into forecasting and all of your effort into being agile and being able to pivot quickly. It's much better to invest in the latter, right? Because there's not really any way to predict the future with a great deal of certainty, right? Rewind the year, would you have started hoarding toilet paper? I mean, I, I hope we didn't even after, but uh, there wasn't really an easy way to see that coming. Like, yes, you could argue that there was bound to eventually be a global pandemic and, and, and all of that. Uh, but even with perfect knowledge of that, it's not obvious that uh, you know the prudent action was uh, to start buying toilet paper. If you're able to pivot quickly, you can get in line first and hoard it for yourself. Again, I'm not proposing that as a reasonable strategy, but the point is at least you have a choice, right? At least you get to drive that process and decide what you want to do instead of just falling victim to whatever ends up happening. So my question for you is, can you manage a supply chain? So before I get into why or how um, you can and, and should help in this effort to, to make our supply chains more efficient, I, I'd first like to kind of convince you that the problem is interesting and, and worth your attention and maybe more complicated than you would have thought at first glance. So for this, uh, we're gonna do a little exercise. And uh, you'll just need a web browser for this. And you know, please keep me open in another tab. So in this game, uh, you're going to take on one of four roles: um, either the retailer, the wholesaler, the distributor, or the manufacturer. And uh, you know, because we usually do a pub night at QSEC, we'll we'll do this in terms of beer. So we're we're manufacturing beer. Um, the game will be played for 20 rounds, where each round is is a week. And I'm going to put a timer on this just because we do have kind of a, a finite amount of time for this workshop of one hour. Each round is going to last 90 seconds because I like to talk a little bit at the end. So the goal is to fulfill your orders while keeping your costs at a minimum. So you want to keep your customers happy, um, but not with uh, not at the cost of storing a lot of stuff. So what that means is, you know, carrying stock like storing stuff that the customer hasn't asked for yet that has a cost with it and in this game it's 50 cents per unit per week uh but back orders which means a customer has asked for something but you were not able to ship it to them that costs you one dollar per late unit per week right so if a customer asks for something on you know week five but you can't satisfy it until week seven that's going to cost you two dollars per unit because you were two weeks um late and the idea here is you want to manage your supply chain in a way that has minimal cost. And what that means is you want to have enough to protect against variability because we can't see the future, uh, but not so much that you're stuck holding on to um, a lot of inventory. So in each week, uh, the player will receive some of the plot, uh, supply that they've ordered or produced during a previous week, if any. So you don't have to order in every week if you don't want to, although I suggest that you consider it. Um, in this diagram above, the supply comes from the person to your right. So for example, if you're the wholesaler, your supply comes from the distributor. Um, the manufacturer is the rightmost person, of course. Um, so they produce their own supply. Um, supply takes three weeks to arrive, uh, which is the lead time. So you know, if you ask for something, it takes uh, some amount of time to deliver. Um, but that doesn't mean you're sort of, uh, you know, not able to do anything um, in the first couple of weeks because the game starts you off with with a schedule of some supply that's already been ordered on your behalf. Um, if the amount of supply that you receive is more than your demand plus your back orders, then it gets added to your stock. And if the amount of supply uh, and stock you have is less than the amount of demand you have, then that gets added to your back orders. So that's the first thing that happens. The second thing that happens in each week is the player will receive an order uh, or demand. Uh, the demand you get is from the person to your left. So for example, the manufacturer would get it from the distributor, the distributor from the wholesaler, the wholesaler from the retailer. Um, and the retailer, because they have no one to their left, they get it from the customer. And the customer is uh, controlled by, by the game. So there's uh, no, no direct control over that. Uh, again, if you can't fulfill that demand using your stock, uh, it gets added to your back orders and then shipped to the customer as soon as possible. So you don't need to worry about manually shipping to the left. You just order from the right. All right. And finally, in each week, you uh, each player will decide how many units, if any, to place an order for 
in the future, right? And because of the lead time, that's gonna come in three weeks. So ideally, you want enough to satisfy what you think the demand will be um, before uh, you get more, right? So because there's this lead time, you're not gonna get the supply that you've ordered until a few more weeks of demand have come in. So you need to think, what do I need now? And what am I likely to need in the near future? And that likely to need part is the bit that makes supply chain so difficult. So my advice to you here would be to try to order enough to guard against uh, volatility and demand, uh, but not too much. Okay, so the way the game works is this. Um, I'm gonna give you a link on the next slide and you will just click to join a random game uh, in a random role. And, uh, and then you'll get this screen. Uh, it's actually not exactly this screen because this is my view as the instructor, but this part down here really is what you'll get. So the way you read this is, you know, this is your role up here. This is what week you're in. Uh, this is how much stock you currently have. This is how much you have on back order. So you kind of combine these two things to let you know what your cost is. Um, this delivery thing, that's how much you received this round. The demand is how much demand you received this round. And the shipment thing, that's what you ship out. So notice in this case, we got a delivery of four. So we have four supply, four demand, and this shipment happens automatically. Um, and finally, this thing down here, this is where you enter how many units you wanna order this round. But of course you don't get them for three weeks. Right? That's, that's the lead time. So please feel free to um, you know, ask any questions in the chat as we get going. I just have to set up the game, which unfortunately I couldn't do in advance because I didn't know how many attendees there would be. Um, I see we have uh, 70 attendees. So I'm gonna add a little bit of a buffer just to be careful. Um, so let me just get at my calculator here. Okay, so I'm going to create Okay. Okay, so I think at this point, most teams are done. I still see a few that aren't, that's okay. You can keep playing in the background, absolutely. Um, but I like to move on and, uh, and debrief a little bit. So once the game is over, you'll see a screen that looks something like this. Um, I don't wanna scroll down too much because I don't wanna throw anyone uh, under the bus about their performance. This I would say looking at the other scores is, is quite average. This wasn't spectacularly bad or anything like that. So what you see in this graph is a sort of explanation week by week of, of what happened. And the total cost, uh, so the scoring system here was uh, 4,600 uh, and that it was an average of 242 units of stock and uh, 12 out of 20 weeks had back orders in them. And here the blue line is your stock level, uh, the red line is your back order, uh, the green are the orders you got, and uh, yellow is the cost. So th these are the orders that you input, like how much you asked for. So notice what happened. If you look at this uh, uh, demand curve, you'll see that earlier on, the demand was very steady, very low. And this team reacted quite appropriately, right? That was because the demand was fairly linear, their requests for stock were fairly linear. That makes perfect sense. Uh, around week eight, you can see that the demand really starts to ramp up. And the very natural thing to do in the situation is to start ordering more. But the problem is, is when you're at the beginning of that curve, you don't know what it looks like, right? You can see that it's rising, but you don't know, is this rising linearly? Is it rising quadratically? Is it rising exponentially? And now you need to start thinking to yourself like, something is going to go wrong here, right? Because I don't know the future. I can tell something's happening, but I don't know what it looks like. Do I want to respond by maybe risking having back orders? Do I want to respond by maybe having extra stock? And it looks like the answer that was given here was that I'd like to respond by having some extra stock to cover these orders. And I would say that generally makes sense because the cost of holding extra stock, we know, is half that uh, in this example, is half that um, of having back orders. So we see at this point, as the demand starts to rise, uh, this team very reasonably said, okay, well, I'm gonna start to order more and more stuff. 
and that's good. We start to have these back orders come in here, and that's kind of inevitable because you know when this started happening, there was really no way to do anything about it, right? Because you have that period of three weeks of lead time. You're just not agile enough to be able to do anything inside three weeks. So once that starts ramping up, you're guaranteed to start getting back orders in this window, right? And as that happened, we started realizing, or the team started realizing more and more like, oh, wow, this demand is really ramping up. We need to start placing these large orders so that three weeks later, we could get that backlog under control. So that's, that's exactly what happened. Uh, this backlog stuff started ramping up for about three weeks. And then at that point, the, uh, grad, like the gradually increasing orders started to get things under control and the backlog started dropping off. Unfortunately, these orders were so large that the uh, sort of consequence of doing that was the stock started uh, shooting back up because the orders were large enough to cover the demand, which is great, but now um, they were larger than they needed to be for that amount of demand. So that's why you see the start costs um, start to skyrocket. Okay, so let's let's talk a little bit about that. Um, I think we can all agree, based on you know the chat messages that I'm seeing, uh, that this was pretty tricky, right? Uh, but why was it tricky? So I would say there's two main reasons that that made this tricky. Okay, the first is a lack of information and coordination between the players. So imagine if all of the players saw all of the same data and could communicate with each other freely, so they could plan out what is the amount of stock I should maintain. Right, because if the retailer starts to see increased demand coming in, it's going to do its own buffering of that. Right, it's going to say, "Oh, well, I'm starting to see an increased volume, so I'm better order a little bit extra." Okay, that makes sense. The consequence of that is the wholesaler is also going to see that increase of volume, and that increase in volume is the increase in the customer demand plus that extra buffer that the retailer added. And the wholesaler is going to make the exact same decision and say, oh, I'm seeing uh, extra demand, so I'm also going to add my own buffer. And then that happens all the way down the chain. And at the end, what you end up with is this buffer of buffers. And it's very hard for the manufacturer to tell what is the actual customer demand here? Am I doing like 10x or 100x what the demand is because every other stage is overcompensating? There's no way to know. So this would be easier if all of the players had full information or as full as the information could be. You don't get visibility into what the customer orders are gonna be, of course, um, but at least the different stages could communicate to try to better manage that. Canaxis uh, helps fill this gap, uh, right? You could help improve that information by allowing every level of that simulation uh, or a, a every level of that supply chain to do simulations. Say, okay, well, how will I actually be able to burn this off? What do I think the demand pattern looks like? Can we all plan what we want our buffer levels to be together? So using software like Canaxis uh, would have been helpful here. Um, the other thing that made this tricky was the unexpected variability of demand. So earlier when I said that each level compensates not just for the demand quantity, but also for the buffers, the previous stages, what that means is that tiny errors at one level really amplify themselves as they spread throughout the network. Um, it's very easy for someone to the left, like the retailer or wholesaler, to overreact to something. And when they overreact, subsequent overreactions at the other stages uh, you know, sort of amplify themselves. Um, but of course, the tragedy is it's not enough to know that it's easy to overreact to prevent yourself from overreacting because it's still also easy to underreact. Uh, and when you do that, you get a huge amount of, of, of back orders. So that's really what the problem is. That's why supply chain is so difficult. It's really difficult to know what to do, right? You can make it easier a little bit um, if you share information with the other people because then you can kind of plan things out and say, yes, I am the retailer, I have this uh, increase in demand variability, this is how I'm going to action that, right? And then you could say something to the person downstream. And by the way, you can't do this in the game, but you could say something like, hey, this is what I need to actually cover real demand, and this is kind of lower priority that I'm gonna need in the future, right? And now that you have these sort of two priority levels, the person to your right can say, okay, well, I need to get these five units, 
and it would be nice to get these, say, additional three units. And then that can be communicated all the way down, and then you have a better chance of fulfilling orders that are due now versus orders that you aren't sure about uh, and, and might come in later. So all that to say, um, supply chain needs software developers. And this is my call to action to you uh, to come talk to Canaxis either you know, after the session at a career fair, reach out to me on LinkedIn or any of my colleagues. We need software developers to help solve these problems um, and, and problems like them. So I wanna talk a little bit about how I can see different uh, areas of expertise contributing to supply chain. So this, this first one would be like backend development. So on my team, we work um, on actually doing the planning that says, I am going to order this much given this demand picture, right? So that, that's exactly the problem we had. My team would be the one that says, this is what the historical demand looks like. This is what my best guess at what the future demand is gonna be, which by the way, isn't always accurate, but you know, it's, it's forecasting, right? It never is. And crunch all those numbers to decide what is the thing that's going to be most likely um, to give me the ability to, to minimize the amount of back orders while also minimizing the amount of stock, right? And that's a complicated calculation and it can depend on many things, right? So imagine, you know, a more complicated example where maybe that wholesaler is serving a few different retailers and now the, the, the wholesaler can't just give everything to one retailer, it has to prioritize between them. Maybe one of the retailers is Walmart and you know that like you really have to make your Walmart orders if you wanna stay in business. But maybe there's some like small mom and pop store, which you know tragically isn't as important. Those are the sorts of planning policies that you need to have um, software for or would strongly benefit from having software for. I, I see a question in the chat, how does software development solve the problem? Well. You know, in this particular instance, you know, it, it helps you fill out that box. In the real world, there's a lot more things that you would base your decision on of what number to put in that box. And those are the algorithms that, that my team work on. Uh, it doesn't stop there for backend development by any means. Um, you can imagine that there's a huge amount of data that needs to get shoved into this database. Um, that is also backend development that, you know, we, we desperately need. Um, there is a huge amount of data that goes along with the supply chain, historical data, um, you know, forecast data, independent demand data that's coming in from, from your salespeople. Um, you know, you can imagine some products that are super complicated to make, like semiconductors, for example, have a huge number, like 20, 30 stages of assembly. Um, there's a lot of data there. Um, so another one would be like front-end developers. Um, notice that the key thing is that this software is not going to just do everything for you. The key is that it's going to give you the ability to run rapid simulations so that you can decide what is the best thing. It's possible that the software would help you decide based on metrics that you specified about what's important to you. But the key thing is it makes it easy for the users to do that simulation. And a huge part of that is having a nice interface that's understandable that presents the data in a useful uh, in a useful way that the user can take advantage of. Uh, user experience is also critically important to this. Um, this is all about presenting the data uh, cleverly uh, in a multitude of ways. So you know, imagine the difference in needs between someone in the C-suite, an executive, saying, "How is my company's supply chain right now?" Right? You need to be able to condense all that information down into like a single number or a single chart or something like that. And, and that's a really difficult problem because there's a lot of information there to aggregate. The set of requirements in that situation are completely different from the set of requirements for like your day-to-day -day planner, like the actual person responsible for managing orders um, at, at the manufacturer. Right, they have a very different view of that data. They need like a nitty gritty, I want to talk about this particular order, whereas someone at the executive level would never likely drill down into that uh, individual um, level. Um, security experts are also hugely important um, in supply chain. So, you know, you can imagine that there's a lot of cost data, for example, that would uh, live inside of a supply chain. So you can know not only what orders are going to be late, but what is the revenue impact? of those late orders. And as soon as you start talking about cost data, 
um, security uh, comes in right away. Um, Canaxis has a very robust set of security protocols and certainly security is, is one of our top priorities when writing code. Um, and that's not going to go away. And as we add more and more functionality, more and more services, there's going to be more and more of a need um, for security experts and software developers or computer scientists or software engineers who are experts in security. Um, in addition to that sort of cost data and, and data like that, uh, there's also information to be gleaned just by looking at things like bills of material for how different finished goods get made, right? If that gives away your recipe, um, then that is something that you would want to guard closely. So supply chain data is, is absolutely sacred and, you know, Canaxis certainly treats it that way. Um, and uh, we need uh, security experts uh, to help us continue to do that. And then the final point I want to make in terms of this, and this is not an, ex an exhaustive list of how um, software developers can, can help supply chain, um, would be things like data science and machine learning. And I, I do see a question in the chat about that. Um, AI is absolutely useful for, for exercises like this. Um, you know, there, there's a few different avenues for it. So one common thing that, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of Canaxis marketing material talks about is the idea of detecting problems in the supply chain using machine learning and data science techniques. So the example I'll give of that is, you know, in, in the exercise, we had this three week, um, uh, three week lead time, right? And in the real world, it's not always going to be three weeks, right? It's going to be, you know, maybe a little more, a little less, right? Maybe these places are kind of far away. And so um, you need to travel between them by plane or by train. And then you're sort of falling victim to the weather or scheduling. Uh, or, you know, maybe you have a contract with a distributor that's just not that good, right? Maybe they just consistently don't keep their word for whatever reason. So if that happens, you need some way of saying, hey, this data that you've entered into the supply chain simulation, uh, it's, it's wrong, right? And uh, using machine learning techniques is one way of doing that. Um, similarly, you might have a contractor that says, you know, they're manufacturing chips and they promise that, you know, 95% of their chips uh, pass QA. And maybe over time you realize actually looking at the shipments we've got historically, only 10% of these uh, are, are passing QA. Like it's disastrously bad. We have to throw out almost everything. That's, that's really bad. And it's not about automatically fixing those necessarily, although, you know, you could maybe do some sort of regression to see what the real values are. It's about presenting that data to the user so that they know that something is wrong. You can also apply machine learning to, to many other areas in the supply chain. That's, that's just two examples, of course. So that's that's my introduction to supply chain um, for you. Um, I've been at Canaxis for about five years now, and I didn't know much about supply chain going in. Um, but uh, since being um, at, uh, at Canaxis for this time, I've learned a huge amount of supply chain. And, and almost every day at work, I'm learning something new. Uh, these are really deep, interesting problems. And what I get to do in my day-to-day -day development is uh, is work on algorithms, which, you know, I spent a long time in school. I, I did grad school and, you know, I, I was an instructor for a while. I, I was in academia for a long time. And I knew that I wanted to work on problems that were challenging and deep and research level. And if that's something that's interesting to you, if you've found, you know, a lot of interest in your algorithms class or your data structures class or that stuff seems cool, um, then there are jobs out there where you do get to scratch that itch or exercise those muscles. And supply chain is one of them. And, uh, you know, for the positions I talked about on the previous slides and more, there are opportunities to work on cool algorithmic things um, in the su supply chain area. So what I'll do now, we have about five minutes left. I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, just type them into the chat. And then to close out the session, um, I'll start another, uh, another set of games. Um, that, uh, you know, you can feel free to join on uh, either with your friends or alone, and I'll set them for another 20 rounds, uh, and it'll be sort of similar to the last one, and you can try to see what your score is. Feel free to download the PDFs. Um, I will archive all of those games at the end of the conference, so you'll kind of have until um, uh, until the end of the weekend to, to get anything. Um, and if you're really keen and want to start a new game with some friends that maybe weren't in the session, uh, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, either on LinkedIn or, or by email. My email's uh, on, on the slide there. So a few questions. I see one question. Is Canaxis currently working on supply chains for vaccines? 
Um, so we do have some customers uh, that uh, are pharmaceutical uh, customers um, that uh, do produce a variety of medicines. Uh, I can't say uh, whether um, you know these actual vaccines are currently running through our software. That's not something I can say. Um, but certainly we do have customers in the pharmaceutical and life sciences uh, verticals. Um, any other questions? If nothing comes to mind now, I'm, I'm definitely happy to talk more in um, any of the career fair sessions or, or anything like that. You can feel free to reach out to me. All right, so what I'll do is uh, I will create a few more games uh, here. And uh, feel free to, uh, I will name them QSOC uh, Post Workshop. And uh, 10 games should be enough to cover anyone in here. Um, okay, so if you click on those same games, you'll be able to get into them. They're all called the QSEC Post Workshop, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And uh, feel free to, uh, to use those. And if anyone would like more created, um, uh, we'll have access to the software for the rest of the weekend, so please uh, reach out and let me know. And uh, with that, I'll uh, let everyone go. Uh, it was a pleasure talking with all of you. Enjoy the rest of your conference, and uh, definitely uh, drop by and say hello. All right, thanks, everyone.